Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Guess what? I'm back. Yep, I'm back doing all my videos again. Now in my new place, in my new room. Yep, after two months absence, because I had to move all my stuff, as well as uh, all my family things, uh, inside uh, two places, uh, one at my grandmother's house, and two at my cousin's house, which he lives very far away from where we are. Um, well, not too far, but, it, but it's almost like, almost, more like an hour from here. Anyway, yeah, we've been busy doing all this stuff, all that packing and all that, uh, um, however, I am going to be recording my review on my webcam because my HD camera is still at my grandmother's house and I have to get that out so pretty soon. So I'm going to review a Christmas movie. In fact, I'm just going to review two horror Christmas movies uh, for now because I just saw it uh, back to back. Uh, in fact, uh, this was a request for my friend Mia. Which she wanted me to do this, but that's okay. She just gave me a Christmas card uh, just recently, and I just read it and I love it. But yeah, I, I've been getting a lot of great gifts, and and I'm I'm also giving her a gift as well for Christmas. So anyway, this is going to be a gift, and I'm going to review the original Black Christmas. 1974, which was produced and directed by Bob Clark, as you may have been familiar with, the same director who went on to direct another Christmas movie that isn't a horror movie, but it's a family-friendly film, and I know I reviewed it already, A Christmas Story. <laughs> but this was considered to be one of the earlier slasher films for its genre, and it's really interesting because it also predates um, two movies, uh, Halloween and When the Stranger Calls. Why, you may ask? Because this was the earlier film that actually had a killer that's making all these obscene phone calls. Which that was featured in When the Stranger Calls. And I guess it also has sort of a Halloween vibe to it I and mean, even though it is Christmas which you basically see a mysterious killer but you don't see him wearing a mask like Michael Myers did in, in fact it's funny that I asked for this because originally this was gonna be set in Halloween before we even had the John Carpenter film so it seems like Bob Clark was going for that attention, but then he decided, you know, why not do a horror Christmas movie? It's actually based on a series uh, called The Babysitter and The Man Upstairs, which the script would be titled uh, The Babysitter, which, there, there you go, a similarity to When a Stranger Calls. And it was written by A. Roy Moore, and uh, this movie was set in Canada at the West Mount section of Montreal, Quebec. So this was part of an urban legend, The Babysitter and the Man Upstairs. So it was like an influence to it. It's a story about a crazy, mysterious, sadistic killer who winds up going upstairs in the attic of a sorority house where all the sorority sisters are celebrating uh, a Christmas party but then they're being stalked and and murdered by having all these obscene phone calls and and, and one of their friends you know, were, winds up missing and killed and they're trying to have a search party by a lieutenant cop so they're trying to find out what's going on. And you want to appear in the voice of, of that particular killer. Yeah. 
Uh, and it just recently came out on Blu-ray um, by Screen Factory. Uh, maybe I might get that movie someday. Hopefully. Because it is indeed one of the greatest horror films of, of all time. But it's also considered as a cult classic. Because not many people talk about this movie. I mean, until years later. So it remains so. And this was before we had the 2006 remake that followed the, the story. Except that movie was quite different from the original because it was more like uh, just like all these standard horror films that we got. But this one basically focuses on the backstory of, of the killer. Yeah, and yes, I'm going to review that film um, later on because I just saw it back to back with the original. And quite frankly, I, I really enjoy this one. It, th this is uh, well made. I mean, it, it basically has a, a great pacing, um, great characters, a, a wonderful cast right there. I mean, this is where they all, I mean, all of them basically have been in other films or, or later films, too. I mean, so we're, we're all familiar with. And I... And it's definitely uh, kind of a dark time to see it um, on Christmas or maybe on during the holidays if, if you're in the mood for it. But I know people nowadays, you know, are not in the mood to watch a you know, horror Christmas movie. Yeah, but hey, this was even before we had other horror Christmas movies that follow after this. You know, like Christmas Evil, for instance, and, and of course... Uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night, <laughs> which spawned off um, a series, and that was a movie that became a big controversy at the time, and wow, what a big controversy it was, because nobody wants to see uh, Santa Claus as a killer, and, and I understand that, but I would watch that, um, I never had a problem with Silent Night, Deadly Night, it was a slasher uh, horror Christmas movie. That what you expect. I mean, it was gory too. They were going for a different approach, so I understand that it could be uncomfortable for people who've seen it. So let's get to the film, Black Christmas, 1974. It stars Olivia Hussey, who's been best known for her role as Juliet in Romeo and Juliet from 1968. That was based on a William Shakespeare's play. That was co-written and directed by Franco Sofrelli, Kier Dolia, Mogul Kidder, who went on to play uh, Lois Lane in all four of the Superman movies, John Saxton, who just um, came from the film uh, Enter the Dragon, and then later he went on to play another lieutenant, kind of inspired his character in... A Nightmare on Elm Street, the original, by Wes Craven. Marianne Waltman, Andrea Martin, been in a lot of stuff. I mean, I know she was in movies like Club Paradise and other comedies too, or any other kind. I know she was uh, later in, in the, the 2006 remake of Black Christmas, but she was also in A Big Frack Group Wedding. Yeah. James Edmund, Doug McGrath, Art Hino, Lynn Griffin, Michael Rapport, with Les Carlson, Martha Gibson, with uncredited roles by Bob Clark himself playing Billy Shadow, so you get to see him all around, and Nick Mancuso, who plays Billy. And he was also did his phone voice that you hear on the phone. And saying all these dirty words and all that. It's written by A. Roy Moore. And it's directed by Bob Clark. The movie begins where we meet a mysterious person. Who turns out to be a sadistic killer named Billy. Who climbs up into the attic of the sorority house. While the occupants are celebrating their Christmas party. You know, during the holiday season. We meet the sorority sisters, the leader, 
named Jess, played by Olivia Hussey, along with her sorority sisters Bob Corrard, played by Margaret Kidder, Phyllis uh, Carlson, played by Andrea Martin, Claire Harrison, played by Lynn Griffin, and several of the other girls had received an obscene phone call from some crazy man who's been calling the house all this time saying all these dirty words and while Barb had provoked the caller um, the man actually told the girls that he's gonna kill them before he hangs up the phone so Barb and Claire were arguing about the threat that that they've been receiving from the caller and by the time uh, Claire went upstairs, already beginning to pack up, she beginning to um, hear a noise coming from the background, which turned out to be a cat that they have. She wants up being suffocated with a plastic bag over around her face and was stuck into a rocking chair and it has been taken up, up on the attic by the killer. You know, Billy. So the next day, Claire's father had arrived to bring her home for the holidays. Um, the house mother, Mrs. Mack, is played by Marion Waltman. You know, happens to be the, the house mother who actually hides all of her booze inside her book and the top of the toilet seat in the bathroom, you know, you know during the party um, earlier in the film. But her and the other girls were we're beginning to find something suspicious about uh, Claire's uh, disappearance. So meanwhile, Jess meets her boyfriend Peter Smythe, who's played by Keir Dolia. He's a pianist, but he's very neurotic. I mean, who actually informed him that she's pregnant and she wants an abortion. But Peter suddenly becomes agitated about the whole thing because he wanted the baby, so he didn't want that to happen. But of course, because he wanted to, to give it a second opinion on this, but she refuses. So then, Mr. Harrison, Barbara, and Phyllis decided to go to the police to report on the missing of Claire. And Jess informs Claire's boyfriend, Chris, played by Art Hindo, about the situation, but by discussing it to the case by uh, Lieutenant. Kenneth Fuller, who's played by John Saxton, which uh, also includes uh, his partner, who's a jerk, who happens to be Sergeant Nash. He also has uh, a detective who laughs, mostly, because you know, he's always been reading all these uh, notes that, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, Barb has sent <laughs> because of the address. And so there you go. Yeah, I got him really, got uh, Kenneth... Uh, laughing too in that one scene. So during that evening they're planning on having a search party uh, because they just found out that Janice had been missing as well. But then they also found out that Mrs. Mack has been murdered uh, with a hook that's dragged into the attic by the same killer. So after the search party, they did found Jenna's dead body. And Jess suddenly receives another obscene phone call from the mysterious man. So it, it might turn out that the mysterious man might be the killer himself. And he's been calling all this time up from the attic. Yeah, I know it's a, it's a dead giveaway, but I had to mention it right away. But at first, they thought that the suspicion might be um, Jess's boyfriend that might be the killer. Because apparently, um, after what happened while Jess was staying with Phyllis inside the house, while they were continuing with the search party all around the neighborhood, um, um, Jess had suddenly felt very confused and suspected that since he's, she's been getting all these phone calls from the, the obscene phone caller, um, that one of the calls might turn out to be, which the cops uh, suddenly uh, suspected that it, that it turned, 
uh, that it might be Peter the whole time that was making these uh, crazy calls. But Peter, of course, was just feeling very upset about uh, how Jess wanted to wanted to have the abortion. So that's why he was feeling that upset about it. But then, but that's what leads to Jess, who was already getting stuck inside the house, being uh, stalked by the killer, who's been hidden all this time, already uh, killing, killing some of the sorority sisters, which includes um, Barb, while she was feeling drunk and sick, was already in bed and, and got stabbed with uh, a glass uh, unicorn. Yeah, you basically see um, just seeing the point of view of the killer and, and just uh, a shadow only with the door open a little um, a little close so you see some light glaring over his, over his face but you only see the eye he grabs the, the glass unicorn and stabs her constantly while Jess was outside uh, on the doorstep, uh, listening to the carolers outside, and the killer just continues to to kill more. Already stalking Jess all around. Yeah, well, he received a phone call from the cop, telling her to get out of the house, but she doesn't listen. But she's trying to suspect what's going on, so she found out until her boyfriend arrives. So that's what the movie is all about. And it's a well-made thriller uh, for its time. And I sense Bob Clark uh, really did do a great job of uh, filming this movie. I mean, he definitely knew what he was doing when he made uh, this particular horror film. I mean, I love the shots where we basically see the killer's point of view, so we don't want to see the killer. And that's pretty good, too, because, I mean... Out of all movies these days, I mean, I think they wanted to have the killer to be more mysterious. So you probably see what was going on you know, during those uh, those deaths of all the sorority sisters and and their mother. There, there were a lot of um, humor into the film, too, because Bob Clark sure loves to throw in some humor in his movies. And I can sense that, too. <laughs> Um, there was one scene I had to admit I did actually laugh was when they went inside the sorority house and you saw a poster where they show an old lady. There's like several pictures of it on one poster, a mean old lady, and at the end she flips the bird. Yeah, I'm. I I know I did that. I can't, I can't believe I I actually did it, but there you go. She flips the bird, giving the middle finger. And then there was another poster that has a peace sign, which there was two uh, naked people. Yeah, a naked guy and a naked girl, and you can only see her ass. <laughs> and and Mrs. Mack was about to cover it. <laughs> uh, there was also some funny moments here, too, was when Barb was... Uh, coming out with a joke because you know she's always drunk all the time um, she mentioned uh, <laughs> the address to the cop because that's what causes the, the detective to laugh it said Palacio Street and <laughs> yeah, you know what that means low job so I thought that was that was really clever yeah. For 98 minutes, though, it, it's perfectly paced, well made, um, has a great score, and great cast too. Um, a lot of great uh, actors in this movie. I mean, Olivia Hussey was very good as Jess. You definitely um, see exactly what's going on um, once you see her character because she's been getting all these obscene phone calls all the time. And, and she's being very suspicious about what's going on here and and she's getting so confused because she's thinking who uh, the killer was and who's doing all this to her and who's keeps stalking her 
as well as all the sorority sisters because you know, they're all getting killed. And you got um, Margaret Kidder, who's uh, very good as Barb. I mean, she was just, of course, a drunk, and she's coming up with all this funny humor. And then you got Andrea Martin, you know, playing Phyllis, uh, and just as uh, sorority sister, too. And all the rest. And John Saxton, very good as the lieutenant. Uh, McKenna Filler. I mean, it's like, you know, this this definitely predates um, the character in A Nightmare on Elm Street, the original. So it was great that he got to play a role like this, you know, after he played uh, that role in, in Enter the Dragon. He was very good in that movie. But there you go. And it's hard to believe uh, that this movie became a cult classic. I also love how the way the film shot, and the ending didn't disappoint me at all, too. I mean, they had an interesting ending, which apparently had been borrowed later on in other films, but but we knew what was going to happen. But as long as uh, you don't get too much of it, uh, I think I might have have already. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's okay. Um, I mean, everybody's seen the movie, but by any chance, uh, check out the film. It's it's great. It's definitely the best horror film that Bob Clark has ever done, and it shows. So anyway, I give the film five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.